Okay, so welcome to this afternoon, and I'm going to talk about designing systems that are responsive in this track. And I spend a lot of time in finance space, big data space, different things where we need to respond in a timely manner, which is an interesting part of performance. So performance is typically something that people say, but it means one of two things typically. It's throughput or latency. So the latency or response time is what this is all going to be about. And when we design our applications, if we don't respond in a timely manner, things don't happen so well. So take this poor person here, they haven't reacted quick enough, and that's going to cause a lot of pain. A lot of our applications end up the same way. And a lot of people talk about how things need to be real time these days. I want to clarify a little bit about what real time means. And I like to think of real time in one of three ways. It's either what's known as hard real time, so this is typically what you'll find when you're programming in sort of things that are very, very time constrained. You must be so deterministic that if you're not deterministic, it is a catastrophic failure. This example here is a gun that you'll find on a British warship called the Goalkeeper. And its job is at that very last instant when a ship is being attacked, it has to defend it. Whenever all of your other defenses have been got past, there's a missile or some plane coming in, and it's really close, moving really fast. What stops it? It's not a person driving this. It's a piece of software being guided by radar operates this sort of gun. Now, if the software on this does not respond, people die. That's the extreme of real time. But many of us aren't at that extreme. But we're at other ends of to the spectrum. And one of the things is like what I call soft real time. So financial markets are typically like this. And in this, if you don't respond in a timely manner, you end up losing money. Maybe not a lot of money, sometimes a lot of money. Night Capital being a good example of a lot of money. But so we have to be fairly responsive in this, and if we don't, we've failed. But more typically, this is the sort of app that most of us end up writing, and we have users who need to so use our systems that must be responsive, I call this the squidgy end of it, but it's really important that we get this right. We get too lazy about this, and we end up with frustrated users. I'm sure all of us are aware that if we're frustrated using an application, we don't want to use it so much more. We don't want to explore it. So getting this right starts to become critical. And actually, as we get involved in this subject, I've often found that typically users of these sorts of systems, where we, d we develop them, and users are meaning the developers who are sort of building these sorts of things, are in this sort of situation. They're building stuff, and they're very much unaware of what's going on. We're happily working away, and we don't know what we're about to just dig into whenever we go live. So I want to try and avoid us getting into this situation by giving you some knowledge for what to be prepared for. So we're going to cover a number of subjects. One of them is how do we test and measure. I'm going to go into a little bit of theory about what goes on in these sorts of systems. A little bit of practice, some stuff I'm going to share from a client of mine that allowed me to share some of this. Some pitfalls that most people fall into. And I'm going to finish off by talking about some algorithms and techniques you can take away. Because I don't want you leaving this being all depressed and this is all hard. There's stuff we can take away, there's stuff we can get better at. So first of all, let's talk about how do we test and measure. This becomes critical in some of our systems. So let's start off and imagine I'm Darth Vader. I've taken delivery of a new Death Star. How do I know how it's going to perform? Well, I've got to test this at this stage. And so simply, I'm going to load it up, going to test it by some types of agents that are going to run against it. This could be a nice, simple means, but our world has changed radically. We have automated clients now. It's not just users pushing buttons. Sometimes some of our clients can throw a lot of loaded systems. In finance world, this happens a lot. So testing with small numbers or even individual very large clients that can throw a lot of load at our system starts becoming really important. It's also important to test with a large number of smaller users that are not doing so often, but just it's another dimension. So we find things like, well, I'm concentrated on one point, or actually just having large numbers breaks our algorithms in other ways. So we, we've got to do that in two different ways. But really importantly is how we measure these systems. We should not be measuring from the load generation side. Because if we're looking up here, and if these guys are generating the load, plus you're also using those to measure, 
you get the wrong results. Like what happens if they're taking GC pauses? What if they get swapped out, they run out of their quantum in the operating system? They start skewing the results. So we need a third party observer to observe this and it's usually best by capturing network traffic. Now this could be at the extreme of you buy some really expensive hardware, that hardware will capture everything and can timestamp all the packets and you can later on analyze it. You don't have to go to that extreme. This could be as simple as using something like Wireshark or TCP dump to capture the packets, you then analyze them later, and you can see the true performance of your system from a latency perspective, because we're capturing on the wire. We're not just relying on the low generation units to do that. So you're gonna start bearing that in mind. We also gotta set this up in continuous integration. If we're gonna do performance testing, we need to be doing it all the time. Because if we're doing this all of the time, we then find out when things go wrong as soon as they go wrong. Not later, not six months later or a year later, whenever we try to work out how we fix that, it gets really complicated. We learn much more by short feedback cycles. Just like we do with the rest of Agile, we have to do this with performance. And also, let's record everything. If we just sample a system, it hides all manner of ills. And here's a really good example of why I'm gonna capture everything on a system and store it in a histogram. And so what is the histogram at this stage? Well, for any given time period, I'm gonna record the number of observations I've seen for that given latency. So this example here is a chart that has got a log scale along the x-axis. And so it's going greater out in time. But the majority of our observations are up here. So Typically, this system is responding in less than one millisecond, which is great, but it's also responding in a much slower fashion further on. So capturing and getting this sort of visual image is so powerful. So histograms are a great way to do this. So they record the number of observations at any given point in time. Now let's look into how a statistician will look at this. And we often use terms like, what's the average response time? What's the standard deviation? Well, this is how nonsense this can become. So let's look at the mode. The mode is the most common occurrence that we find. Our mode is there on the graph. That's interesting, that's typical. It's, it's, it's the one of the few measures that is kind of useful. Median, so that's, imagine we line up all of our observations and we pick the middle point. It's not actually telling me that interesting things here. This is a really silly one, the mean, the average, the one we always talk about, that is telling me really nothing about what's going on. It doesn't tell me the most typical case and it doesn't tell me about what's going on out here. It's actually in the middle of a wasteland telling me nothing useful at all. So don't use means, don't use averages when you start describing your system. And don't talk about standard deviation because look at that, that is not a normal distribution. It's multimodal, it's very skewed, it's got high kurtosis, it's from so many levels, it is not something you want to use standard deviation to describe. So capture all this data and put it in histograms. Now let's take a simple example from a system. So let's say I have a system, I wanna run it at a thousand transactions a second, and the mean response time at that is 50 microseconds. This would be a trading system. You could easily just translate this into any other type of system and scale the number. So that could be, five milliseconds, it could be 50 milliseconds. It's just a unit of time. But typically in finance, we're looking at around this. So we're looking at uh, 50 micros in this case. That all looks really good. Well, what if we're generating quite a lot of garbage and we're seeing a young generational garbage collection happening once every millisecond? And the, or every second, and that takes a 25 millisecond pause. Well, if you think if you've been putting them in at one a millisecond, we've got an interesting effect goes on here because you put something in and it's gonna wait 25 milliseconds. And, but around that period, you're still injecting another load. So something's taken 25, next one's taken 24, next one's taken 23. This continues right down until you're back at the 50 microseconds level again. So 12.5 on average is what's happening during that pause you end up with an average mean latency of 300 microseconds. See, it's kind of crazy. You just mix in a GC pause and all of a sudden your average makes no sense. Now imagine you're offering this to a customer and you've got a service level agreement on it and you're expecting 50 microseconds and you can't explain these 25s or you, whether you're aware or were not. You try to explain it to your boss, you end up feeling a bit like this because it's not making any sense. You've been using averages and it's crazy. 
So forget these averages, start talking about percentiles. Gil Tenney has lent me this graph, and it's kind of really interesting. So rather than looking at our distribution, let's add things up as quantiles or percentiles. So let's have a percentile distribution. And so as we go along the x-axis, we're going up in nines, 90%, 99, 99.9. .9, and we can see what's happening to our distribution over time. There's an interesting effect in here. So go back to my example about the GC. If you were not capturing those 24 additional requests, because your system is generating load as your system is measuring this, maybe even blocked by what's going on, is it suffers from a thing called coordinated omission. And what that means is the 24 samples that you should have had when that, tw when that GC pause is going on, when you're running at one a millisecond, they're lost. That skews all your results. So things look better than what they are. And the real giveaway in these sorts of things is you don't get nice smooth curves, you get these jagged jumps. And if you start catching things like this, you can see it by looking at the graphs, but you've got to be measuring it to do it. So I recommend you look at a thing called HDR histogram and start capturing your data and put this in this. So don't deceive yourself. We've got to measure, we've got to know what's going on, we've got to be able to read this. And if we start doing this, we start behaving like proper scientists and we won't deceive ourselves. So, Let's get into a little bit of theory now to explain a little bit of what's going on and why systems become unresponsive. Who all seen the J curve? Typically the response time of systems end up looking something like this, where as we increase load and we use our system more and more, so we increase utilization, response time starts to go up this curve. This is very typical to what's going on. There's a lot of interesting characteristics, but most systems follow this J curve, where response gets unresponsive over time. Well, let's look into this a little bit. Why does that happen and how can I work this out? Well, what we're talking about if you start looking this up is a thing called Kendall notation. It's a good way of describing this. So you characterize the system for how things queue up at it using this notation. And what the notation here is showing you is three parts. It's the arrival rate to the system, which is the M, the service time itself for the behavior of that, and then how many instances of your service. So MD1 means it's a Markovian arrival rate. The service itself behaves in a deterministic way, and we have one instance of that service. If you describe your systems in these sorts of fashions, you can then pick the equation you need to work out what it's going to do under load as you increase utilization. Arrival rates can be different. They can be completely uniform. They could be Markovian. They could be Erlang. There could be very many other different options in this, but it's a very interesting thing to look into. A lot of what I'm going to show you in the talk is that it kind of will inspire hopefully some wiki walks and a bit of Googling to find out what some of these things are. I don't want to spend a lot of time on exactly what these things are. But for an MD1, I get this formula. So for this formula, I can work out what my mean response time is going to be, I plug it into this formula for the service time and the utilization, and I can then plot that graph. The really interesting thing is, what is utilization? Well, utilization is a function of service time again. So the how fast our service runs becomes really, really critical to how responsive it is. That may seem kind of obvious, but it's much worse than you actually think. So if we go back to this graph, let's say I'm running here at the 90% utilization point. So normally when my system's not loaded, it's responding in about one unit of time. When I'm running at 90% utilization, it's running in more than 10 units of time, whatever that unit happens to be. Now, if I take my service and I profile it and I work out how to make it faster and I take it down from whatever it was to being 50% of what it was before, your system doesn't have an average response time of 50% better because that response time goes into utilization, what actually happens is you come right down this curve to about here, and your system now is 10 times more responsive. So understanding the mathematics behind this is so powerful, and it gives you great results in your system. So sm relatively small changes can have a massive impact, and this applies to anything you do, anything that's a service. We are a service to the projects we work on. If we're used at greater than 70% utilization, we become unresponsive. So if there's any project managers in the room, please pay heed. Don't try to use people at 100% utilization or even more, because they will not be responsive. We have to have slack in our systems for this to work. So 
we've got to make sure we've got sufficient capacity. This is a key part in how we work. Now, the original queuing theory is 100 years old. But about 50 years ago, John Little made an interesting observation on this in that for any system that's in steady state, and that's where the number of arrivals is equal to the number that are leaving the system in that nice steady state as it's flowing through, these properties hold true regardless of the service time, regardless of the arrival rates. And so we can easily work out one of these if we know the other two. This is a very useful property of the system. So looking into the work of John Little and Little's Law gives us a good way forward. And the way I like to use this is if I bound my queues, I can limit the service time. So if I want to have a response time that I'm going to always honor, if I bound my queue, I can then make sure I don't exceed that response time. My system can stay responsive. Well, people go, well, what if you're getting more load than you've got at that point? Well, you reject input. It is really that simple. You do not want to keep taking input. And as you keep taking input, your system keeps growing and growing and growing in its queues. And eventually, you run out of memory and you crash. Which one's better? This is say, sorry, we're busy. Please come back again later and give a really good service to everybody who's already arrived. Or let in more load. Let the queues all build up. Have the system crash. People who are in don't get a good service. Nobody can get a good service afterwards because your system's down. That's a much more professional approach, it feels. We should be thinking in these ways. So if you've got unbounded queues in your system, you have a real problem. So what's one of the other things we can use to speed up? Well, we can go parallel. And the common way people look at going parallel is Almdahl's Law. What's really interesting about Almdahl's Law is People think Amdahl's law is all about encouraging parallelism. If you read Amdahl's original paper, you'll very quickly realize he was not encouraging parallelism. He was trying to discourage it. He was showing how difficult it actually is. He wanted to peddle mainframes. He wanted to sell you one of his big mainframes and not buy one of these new mid-range systems that had many processors in them. Because he was pointing out that it's actually very hard to do parallel programming. And so what his argument is about is if I've got any task, I can split it up in some ways. Now, which bits of it can I split up to run in parallel? So in this case, if I can split up A, I can get a nice speed up if I applied over four cores. But if B is the only thing I can split, I don't get the same speed up. So it becomes critical how much of your algorithm you can actually make run in parallel to make this work better. And so. We start graphing this and we look at what speed up's possible. Look at you start going up these cases. So even if I just have 5% of my algorithm that's the sequential component, I can never get greater than a 20x speed up. In fact, I'll never even get to 20x speed up because I can asymptotically approach it, but I never get there. And this makes a really interesting challenge. Like if your algorithm is 50% parallel, you're never looking at 2x speed up no matter how many cores we throw at this. So it becomes really critical to work out what is the sequential component of your algorithm, and many people don't even know. But do you know what? Amdahl had the happy clappy view of the world. It's actually much worse than that. Neil Gunther discovered from real world's measurement that actually you could not even achieve Amdahl's law from a speed up perspective. What he discovered is that contention point is really important. But Amdahl hadn't talked about the coherence side of things. So you have to plug in the contention and the coherence values into your equations to work out what is your possible speed ups. Now, if I apply uh, the contention and coherence, what I end up with is with this graph. So if I assume it takes 250 microseconds to make any state I have as part of my contention coherent among those threads or processes, after a while, you start to find out that the coherence cost starts to dominate. And if we look at this graph, it kind of looks kind of nice at the two and four and eight processors. But look what starts to happen beyond 16 processors, 32 processors. We start to diverge. And then it actually starts to get worse. And we're now in a world whereby we're getting more and more cores. And the light has been shown on algorithms to the point that these things are starting to appear. And we have to be aware of that. So going in parallel is not necessarily an easy thing. We have to be aware of what we can do, what we can't do, and what are our limitations and how this works. So 
Let's come back again to that. So we looked at, we can queue on things, we can make things go in parallel, but it's all about the service time itself. Because if the service time itself is not deterministic, it gets really, really tricky. And this is purely about algorithms at this stage. We have to go back to basic algorithm theory. We cannot wait a year and get a faster CPU. We can't even wait 10 years to get a significantly faster CPU anymore. We will get more CPUs, we will get a marginal speed up, but we cannot just do that. We have to go back and learn about algorithms like we did in the past and start taking these seriously again. So you've got to know the order of your algorithms, big O notation, back to university stuff again, and start applying this. And if you've got algorithms that are n squared or n cubed or whatever interesting on input, you're going to get catastrophic behavior as we start to scale up. We need to stop doing that. And that can be as simple as I go to the database, I read out some data, and then within a loop as I'm iterating over that, I go back to the database again. You just get an n squared algorithm. People need to start thinking like this and realize what's going on, otherwise we're not responsive. So that's the theory over with for a bit. Let's look at a bit of practice and see what can actually happen. So one of my clients has kindly let me share some data where I came in for a consulting engagement over a week and the goal was to make their trading system more predictable from a latency perspective but also lower the latency if we can. The main goal was actually to increase predictability and latency and how it happened. There's what was really interesting is, is these were really, really good folk and they were very good at what they'd done and most of the obvious mistakes that people make, they had already corrected. You're working here at the level of microseconds, tens of microseconds for response time. I know not everyone works at that, but this is where these guys were. What I find really interesting in coming back into this is you when you start dealing with really, really good people, it's not that you have to be better than them. You can come in and help people by coaching. And I find that our industry really suffers from the fact that we don't apply coaching so often. I used to come from a sports background and I had coaches who I was faster than them. I could do all sorts of interesting things because I was younger and able to, but they could still coach. We can do that in our industry as well and we just don't do it enough. So I, I really enjoyed this engagement because I was able to get these guys to be better just by coaching and following them through stuff. So what did we discover? Well. We measured their system on the first day, and this was a scatter plot of the response time of their system for a whole given set of inputs. And this is where you start seeing again, averages mean absolutely nothing. There's lots of really interesting things going on here. There's a warm up period over here, there's all of these interesting spikes, and there's a lot of activity around. So it's, it's kind of fascinating to what's going on. So you do this, you start profiling, you profile in a number of different ways, you start realizing where your costs are. And one of the first things we discovered in this is there was a contention problem with multiple producers into the system causing thread contention. As I worked through the code base, I discovered they're using the disruptor, they're using an older version of the disruptor that had a particular problem with multiple producers. I know that the version three onwards had that corrected and improved, so we upgraded to that. That's what happened. So software upgrade, boom. We've actually got a bit better and we've got a bit faster. So that's one change. But again, the, notice like we measure, we apply science, we create an experiment to test something out, then we go ahead and make a change and then we measure it again. And so we've got faster, but we still got some interesting artifacts. Once we've taken out that other thing, there's some very interesting artifacts like what is going on here? I find that sort of stuff fascinating. So be curious, dig into it, you learn so much. Well, if I zoom into that, this is what it looks like in some detail. So it's clearly, this is a normal sort of case. Some things are taking longer, then all of a sudden I get a gap, a jump up, another gap and a jump down. So what can be causing that? You start asking the questions. Again, let's go back to apply science. I have a theory, how do I test something to see if that theory is correct. So I design an experiment for that. I then measure and I check the results. So one of the things I had a theory about was that this was a data structure resize issue and potentially a garbage collection problem. Now the garbage collection problem is easy because you output the GC logs and you correlate the GC logs with the time of these events and guess what? There's a GC event here and a GC event here. So, okay, that told me something. That was the cause of a number of things, but it didn't tell me what went on up here. 
Now, I've seen a lot of these sorts of graphs. This is another thing is humans are great at pattern matching. So visualizing this stuff is so important. Collect your data, put it in graphs, put it in histograms, scatter plots, sort of percentile burnups. All this sort of stuff is really useful because you start spotting patterns and you start realizing what this is. So this screams out to me data structure resizing. So how do I test that? I wrote an aspect. I use aspect-oriented programming to go and intercept any time some of my structures had a resize method. And if that resize method was called, I logged it. And I logged where it was happening in the code. And guess what? These were hash map resizes. And interesting, the hash map resize was actually the cause of the GC. Because as you resize a hash map, it creates, it copies all of its internal structures and it allocates them in a bigger space. So it's resizing upwards. And that was interesting because then whenever it finished copying all of this, it lets it all go and I end up with another GC event later on. <laughs> And so that's just doing some analysis, digging in, finding out. You understand so much about your system. It's really quite good fun. So we did that. And that's what our graph looked like afterwards. So we don't have those step ups anymore. We don't have some of those weird effects. But yet there's still lots of interesting things going on. Why have we got these big like hills and spikes in the, cu in the curve? So we try to work out what some of that was. What's the cause? Use uh, performance counters to find out what the CPUs are doing and find out there's lots of bursts of cache missing. But they were almost metronomic. We dig into it again. Ooh, it looks suspiciously like the time whenever you get loose time slices, quantum should give up on the CPU. So we tracked the counters for that. It was definitely all the cache misses according to that. How can we stop that from happening? Well, if you're constantly just moving around threads whenever things happen, you will get those cache misses because your cache isn't warm. So we wrote a script that after the application has been running for a little while, so we let it actually run for a while, and then we pin threads to cores so they're not allowed to move around. That's what happened. <laughs> See, we get into the, oops, we get into the run a little bit, then we apply the script. Now it's much more stable. All those migrations, all this stuff up here has gone away. It's gone down. And again, you start seeing like, oh, there's interesting cache effects and what's going on. And this is just fun analysis. What's all this other stuff? Well, that didn't take too long to dig into. That was GC. Young generation GC. So if we cleaned up the GC, this almost becomes a straight line. And then you've got a nice, soft, real-time system. So it's just like over a week, doing a lot of analysis, finding out what's going on, and we can greatly improve the system. At the end of this, it's a lot faster than it was, but it's a lot more predictable in its response time. So that's part two. Let's talk about pitfalls. What can go wrong along the way? So you're digging along, and you don't want to end up into that big pile of the brown stuff. We'll start at the bottom. Our modern CPUs are doing lots of really interesting things, but the most important thing that you're driving towards is energy usage. They want to reduce energy usage as much as possible. So as they're running, they will come down into lower power states. They will speed up, speed down, all sorts of interesting things, and these have a big impact on the responsiveness of your system. You can end up turning some of these states on, turning some of them off, but you've got to be aware that this is becoming more and more of a feature. So if you're using lots of CPUs very intensely, you can guarantee that the frequency overall of your socket is going to go down. If most of your CPUs are quiet and one or two are running fast, it will rebalance and actually allow you much higher clock frequencies than what's going on. You can control some of this stuff at a lower level. So things like turbo boost, P states, C states, these are all very interesting things that control what's going on. We've also got things like hyper-threading, where within the same core, we can have multiple threads going through the same core. And in some cases, that's faster. In some cases, it's slower. You have to measure to work out what's the right thing for your application. But even more interesting is things like SMI, so system management inter interrupts. So your stuff that you can't do anything about at an operating system level where your CPU will stop occasionally and take its temperature, check for faults, do all sorts of interesting things to see what state it's in. I see looking at some of the latest CPUs, this is getting even more scary because they're doing things like maybe checking things and sending data to the NSA. <laughs> Look in for AMT and you'll get scared. This sort of stuff is happening. <laughs> but so lots of stuff is happening at this sort of level. 
as we go up a level to the bigger box on the whole, we'll see that our, our CPUs and our systems have become very complex. They're in fact networks now where we've got multiple cores inside our machines with layers of caches, shared caches, but they're all separate sockets with memory connected directly to them. So if I have a core up here and it's talking to memory down here, it's a different cost than talking to memory over here because you have to cross a network on your motherboard between sockets. And that adds additional costs. We're now in the world of non-uniform memory access. So knowing how you access memory becomes really important. But one thing to take away from all of this is like, Close to the CPU, things are very fast. The further away they are, they start getting significantly slower. But there's three bets are being taken. One is the temporal bet. So if you've used something recently, it's likely to be in cache for you using it again soon. The second bet's a spatial bet. So things that are close together will be used together. So your CPUs are doing lots of things for that. And the third bet is a pattern-based bet. So if you use things in a predictable pattern, hardware will prefetch your memory for you. If you don't do one of those three things, you're going to be getting a lot of cache misses and very unresponsive memory. How extreme this is, it's actually faster to stream data sequentially off an SSD than it is to randomly access mere memory. Now, it's called random access memory. It's a complete misnomer. It does not give you random characteristics. It behaves quite like tape. The more you work with different memory subsystems, you start to realize that it does not matter what type of memory subsystem, be it main memory, be it storage, be it whatever. And that could be spinning disks, it could be SSDs, it could be anything. If you deal with them in a sequential fashion, they're very fast. You deal with them in a random fashion, or you try to have the arbitrary access, they get a lot slower. Everything is tape, and you've got to start thinking that way. So we come up from the hardware into the operating system. So many teams, Programmers do not talk to systems people and vice versa. And things are so misconfigured. And we need to work better together because there's a number of things at the operating system level need to be configured and set up or have a massive impact on performance. The virtual memory systems, one thing. How we set up buffers for networking, how we set up buffers for dealing with storage. If these are misconfigured, it's like three, four acts difference in performance, sometimes 10 acts difference in performance in how this stuff's set up, and most people don't even do any work in this area. So we could be spending weeks optimizing our code when all we needed is a kernel parameter change, and we could have had a three or four act speed up. We will not get that unless we start working together. So we have to start doing that with our teams and going forward. We get up into our VMs, and there's lots of things going on. One of the most horrible things in our VMs are these things called safe points. Now, many people probably won't be aware of what a safe point is, but there are operations whereby within our JVMs, and this happens across other virtual machines as well, is that under certain conditions, the world must be stopped to perform that action. So that action may be garbage collection. It may be sort of inflating a lock from bias lock into a full lock, and all sorts of interesting things. Whenever these things happen, all threads have to be brought to safe point, and then that action goes forward. That starts to really impede progress inside our VMs. And going back to Amdahl's law, that starts becoming the sequential component in our algorithms. I see systems whereby you throw lots of cores and you think your code is even completely parallel and having no contention, but because it contends on things within the VM, like having a lot of, oh, having a lot of allocation, or having a lot of locks, it just chokes to the point that you don't get utilization up on the box. We have to be aware of this and how we move forward. Virtualization is another good one. Whenever we go to the virtualized world, when we make a system call, we call into a guest operating system. It then has to call into the host operating system. And depending on how that's set up, this can be a massive cost in what's going on. This is one of the ones where I have seen a 10x difference between reading data off a network that's well configured in a virtual environment through, uh, compared to working in a native environment. And that can be as simple as seeing sort of a few thousand messages a second come in to jumping to 70,000 messages a second. Getting this stuff configured and getting it right really matters. People say you throw virtualization at the problem that only adds a few percentage points. That is not true in many cases. When you start going out of your virtual machine to go to disk or go to network or do things like get a lock, 
it makes a massive difference because you're calling it out through multiple layers and there's a large tax for that. Many of us have to write code and we're sharing between threads. And so whenever we've done work on one thread, we need to hand it off to another thread. How we typically do that is with a lock. And then within the lock, we use a condition variable. So in Java, that could be wait notify. It could be signal await with a condition variable. If you're using Java util concurrent five, these sort of things happen across all languages. What you're basically doing is getting the operating system involved in notifying from one thread to another. This is a very expensive operation typically for what's going on. And once you do this, quite often your thread will be suspended and it will not run for quite a large time in the future. This is a nightmare in trading applications. If you're in games or audio, it's really noticeable, but it's starting to become a problem just even in normal applications because again, it comes down to that sequential component. It chokes algorithms, it ties threads together and you don't get the throughput. You won't scale up with multiple cores. You basically end up playing roulette with your latency and your throughput when you start doing these sorts of things. We gotta unentangle these things. So Joe Spolsky has this law of abstraction. It's really interesting. The leaky abstraction problem, and this has become a serious problem, is we keep layering these things and we call them abstractions. They are not abstractions, they're layers of crap in many cases. If we go back to what Dijkstra said about abstraction, an abstraction has to be introduced to make something more precise. Note the word precise. Whenever you put a layer of abstraction on and make something more vague, that is not a good abstraction. It's back to my point again, it is a layer of crap. And yet we keep doing this and we keep talking about we're adding abstractions. All we're doing is making things vague, unclear, and giving ourselves bad performance and bugs in many cases. I, I, I've got this thing where I hate frameworks and I think libraries is the way we should go. Frameworks impose ways of working that we've got to stop doing. So uh, Dave Thomas has this expression that frameworks are the ways of injecting your dependencies into other people's code. It shouldn't be like that. What we should be doing is writing nice libraries that pay for themselves. So when you include the library, it makes your life better. And you include it because you want to, but you shouldn't be forced to do that. And our abstractions is one way of looking at that because many of these things are non-trivial and they have to deal with the complexity in the right way. I like to think of this as mechanical sympathy. We have to understand what's going on below but just in sufficient detail so we can get the best out of it. We don't have to become experts in it, but we've got to have a reasonable idea so we're using it in the right way. And don't hide behind the excuse of we have an abstraction layer that hides that. It should be making it more precise and easier to use. If it's not doing that, it's doing it wrongly. Interestingly, if we want to be responsive, what happens when our systems start to fail? Well, as our systems get bigger and more complex and distributed, Things are failing all the time. In fact, in any significantly large system, there's always something in the state of being broken. But you've got to continue on. And I love this sort of thing. Anybody seen this scene? It's wonderful. It's like you, you keep going on. It's only a flesh wound. Lost a leg, lost an arm, keep going. Our software needs to do that as well. And hopefully not pause and give poor response time as it does it. So we get into our algorithms at this stage. What can we do? What can we go forward with? Well, first thing you should do is, if we're going to do science, we're going to measure, we're going to do things right, we have to do clean experiments. If you were doing chemistry, you would not use all of your little utensils that are dirty. Hey, I want to check a chemical reaction, I'm going to put two agents together. I'm not going to do it in a dirty test tube because it's not going to give me the right results. We've got to start doing this in our software. So we need to work out how to isolate our tests, how to take all the noise out of what's going on. So we're measuring the right sort of things. I'm not going to go into the detail. Whenever the slides are available, you can go off and you can Google for some of these sorts of things. But one thing I would really recommend is looking at J Hiccup on this. So just Google for J Hiccup if you get the chance. It's a lovely little agent that runs inside your process or can run outside your process. And what it will do is it'll tell you that a thread was not able to run at any given point in time. And that tells you an awful lot about why you've got pauses in your applications. You can start identifying when and where, and you can correlate with what your applications are actually doing. So we've got this clean environment. We've now got to run tests and we've got to measure. And quite often we've got a profile. Who here has used JVisual VM? 
Anyone use your kit? Do you have profiler? All of those? As profilers, they lie. They do not tell you what's going on in your code. They're reasonable for a certain class of problem. Like that class of problem is typically where you're going to network or you're breaking out of your program to do something else. If you get something that's CPU intensive or memory intensive, they do not find it. Because back to those evil safe points I talked before about, that is when they sample your program. They only sample at safe point. Not in the highly optimized code that your JIT has made for you. It's no good. You need to use profilers like the new J Rocket Mission Control with the flight recorder built in, SLARS Performance Studio Analyzer, Intel VTune. These sorts of profilers actually do proper sampling and they will tell you where the real issues are in your code. You've got to move forward to that level and stop using some of those other profilers. So one of the other things I like to do is incorporate histograms. So as I, as I said before, histograms are a great way of measuring. If you put them into your code, so like whenever you're getting requests in and stuff, record the time and stuff, record it in these histograms. They're really cheap, they're really simple. You can get a real good view of what's going on. HDR histogram is one of the best for that. It stands for high dynamic range. It works quite like floating point numbers. So you don't have to work out what all the bins are in advance. It's very, very efficient. So what can I do to get off this J curve, even as my utilization goes up? Well, there's a really old, boring technique that works really well that's so misunderstood, and that's batching. Everyone thinks that batching is this thing that slows you down and adds latency. Well, if it's done well, it actually improves latency. How can it do that? Well, most people batch by waiting for a timeout and then applying a batch. Don't wait for timeouts with a batch. What you do is, as soon as something is available, you perform the action, you go back, and next time you pick up as much as you can. And you do that by introducing something in between. So if I want to use a resource, in this case, let's say I have got multiple threads. Let's say I have 10 threads want to write something to disk. If they start queuing up to do it, because they're going to have to do it under a lock, one thing's going to take one unit of time to do it. The next thing's going to take two units of time, right up to 10 units of time. So you're going to mean response time of five units of time. Now, if I take a different approach and I put them all onto a data structure and have a separate thread writing them down to the storage, my worst case scenario is I pick up one thing off the queue to begin with, I write it down to storage, I come back to the queue again, and I take off the next nine and write them down to storage. I've completed the whole operation in two units of time. My mean is less than two units of time, and that is the worst case scenario. You often find in these burst scenarios that you get all 10 and you put them down in one go. This massively improves your utilization and you don't go up the J curve anywhere near as quickly. So my tip is start looking for things that you can amortize. And once you start thinking about this, you start finding them all over the place. It's a really useful way of looking at them. But the thing that stands out from that is you have to learn to go asynchronous. And once you start going asynchronous, you can have cues through your system, you can measure your cues, and you can start applying back pressure by bounding them. If people think they don't have cues in their system, they're so wrong. Because if you use locks, if you use an I.O., most things that you come across will have a lock in front of it. It will have a mutex of some means. And guess what? When two or more threads go for something at the same time is, one gets it and the rest join a queue. So cues become something that are everywhere through your code. Make them first class concepts, start dealing with them, start measuring them, apply Little's Law to what's going on. Now I've got a much better view of what's going on in my system. So back to my thing I said earlier about applying back pressure and not letting other things in. So let's say my storage is not keeping up. Well, these threads won't be able to do any more work. If they don't do any more work, they don't take stuff in from the queue. That will back up to the network. We won't be able to put any more data on the network. That will back up these threads which will cause that queue to back up, which will cause the queues, or these threads here to back up that are receiving network traffic from the clients. So that way I can apply back pressure the whole way through the system. Well, what's that look like? Well, let's say these guys are making HTTP requests on the front end. Well, once your threads are all busy and your queues are all full, return a 403, server busy, or a 503, server busy at this stage. Don't keep accepting new requests. It's a much more friendly way to be working. So now we've done that, we're now going to run 
all asynchronous, and it's so important to run asynchronous. I like to think this is a way of getting out of your own way. We've got to be non-blocking. We've got to go forward. We've got to keep things nice and efficient. Get off the synchronous way of working. And we can do this by stop hogging stuff. So the synchronous methods ends up with us hogging. We get stuck. We get doing that. We can also start operating in some interesting ways. So now that I'm not hogging, now that I'm running asynchronous, and now that I'm not using the operating system, I can start using things like lock-free algorithms, kind of specialist ways of working, interesting ways of going forward. We can start doing these sorts of things. Kind of going to rush through a little bit to the end here. So let's say, now I've got all my state. I'm running in this nice way that's all free. You get the nice big scary TCP state diagram. I'm not expecting you to know this. But the important thing is for any given state machine, what if you could just read where you're currently at? You make them observable. Your state machine becomes observable. Then you can easily make progress to next steps by targeting where you're at and making decisions. You can start batching up your operations. You can start monitoring. You can profile. You can tune. So as we make our systems, we design our code, make it observable. Put the current state in a volatile variable that you can read it. This lets you make your things observable, make good progress, keep going. So here's a really simple thing that we can do to get a lot of work through our systems, make them simple, make them fast whenever they're now in sync. Let's say I now sequence data into my system. So I introduce a sequencer. I get lots of traffic coming in. Once that's sequenced, I can send the same sequence to two or more services. Those services can respond. If you're responding back in an idempotent fashion, what happens with the first one to respond? You process it. If it's item potent, you get another message back. Well, that's absolutely cool. It doesn't matter. You throw away the second one. I say one of these dies. I've got a very responsive system because it doesn't matter. You start playing around with this. You can run things on different memory settings, different processors. We'll start doing that. And then all of a sudden, I'm whizzing back. And it doesn't matter one's slower, one's faster. We still get responsive really quickly. And the first one to get there is there and it's fast. If you want to read, you replicate to many other sites. And that lets us go forward and lets us go forward really quickly. Final bit I'll tell you on techniques and algorithms is please go back and learn data structures. There's one thing that will stick with us through our careers is data structures will not go away. There's more to the world than maps and lists. You start getting into loads of wonderful things like bloom filters, skip lists, all sorts of interesting tree structures and stuff that's out there. These things are dead useful for how we end up working. They'll stay with you for your career much better than the latest version of some library that's just out and that's trendy. So I'm going to wind up quickly in closing. Something's coming. It's a kind of interesting world that we're now living in. To use a common meme, <laughs> is winter coming? What's really coming? is the Internet of Things. Last year, for the first time, we passed the point where the number of devices on the Internet is greater than the number of people on the planet. Connected devices is now greater than the number of people. This is continuing to go up. We could be anywhere up to 75 billion, depending on your point of view, by 2020. So that's going to keep happening. So what that means is we cannot control our arrival rates. The fact that we can control them, we don't want to because we want this business to come. We've got to deal with it. So we got to. And when we design our applications, if we don't respond in a timely manner, things don't happen so well. So take this poor person here. They haven't reacted quick enough. And that's going to cause a lot of pain. Really think about how we start improving our service times. We just cannot keep expecting to have our systems work the way they used to and not perform. Our other choice is to go parallel, but that's hard. It's really difficult. It's much easier to try and improve service times. It's much easier to focus in on what we've got. And on that point, I'll finish off.